Now, a child of God, born of God, may not be conscious of any acts of sin in his life or maintain that he no longer has a sin nature, which produces acts of sin, or he may think that he has overcome his sin nature with his new nature by the indwelling Holy Spirit <clears throat> for a period of time in order to achieve moments of sinless perfection. <clears throat> Some might even falsely contend that they are bound, they are beyond the categories of good and evil because they possess the Spirit of God or have achieved some kind of spiritual transcendence. But whatever one does thinks he does not con contradict the fact that while in one's mortal body one nevertheless has a sin nature, commits sin all the time, and constantly falls short of the glory of God his absolute righteousness all the time. Children of God, born of God, including apostles, as well as all unbelievers, that's included, that's in view. This is clearly and repeatedly conveyed in Scripture. Look at 1 John 1.10. Now, even admitted to by the Apostle Paul after he became a child of God, born of God, and an Apostle. He was a believer because he declared in this last half of Romans chapter 7 that he had the conflict between sin nature. Now, all unbelievers have that. People say this passage is about Paul as when he was an unbeliever. But he also declares in this passage that he had the inner man. Well, that's not Paul the unbeliever, that's Paul the believer. Furthermore, second clause of the if-then statement contains two phrases, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. It declares the result of when we, we children of God, born of God, do say that we have no sin. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. It brings out into the light those children of God, born of God, who have willfully hidden their mentalities from the sphere of light in which God dwells, the sphere of his absolute righteousness. That's why 1 John 1, 7 says, if we walk in the light of God, walk in the light, not according to it, and we mentally shield ourselves from how righteous he is and how fallen short of that glory of God we are, which the righteousness of God, the sphere of man, the sphere of man cannot attain under his own auspices in his mortal life. So when he confesses his sins, his faults, God declares him righteous in the temporal life of his own grace. This is man's typical self-deception, his arrogance, which serves to puff himself up to think that he has committed no sin. For a period of time, even. That he has no sin nature, or has overcome it, if he is a child of God, born of God, with the new nature within him that the Holy Spirit has provided. And that Joseph Prince thinks that you can achieve this under the grace of God, under your own auspices, by your effort. Kind of contradictory. And it's not going to be there because we look at this passage in 1 John 1 8 and 1 10. We have to confess sins to stay in fellowship with God. To stay in fellowship with God, we're, we could do it also with victorious living. That's not feasible and possible with the sin nature in the in the temporal life now. So the Greek word, aeotus, rendered ourselves as the first word in the second clause. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. It is in an emphatic position, emphasizing that such a self-deception is deliberate and willful, bearing no resemblance to the truth nor to innocence. Such children of God, born of God, are in danger of becoming progressively, let's fix this, 
oops, progressively delusional and evil as a time span that they claim to be without sin increases. Moving on, so when children of God, born of God, feel close to God, they should nevertheless remember that a closeness with God, i.e., put the letter A there, a genuine fellowship with him is not due to their being free of sin, for that acts of being of sin being committed by them, or some kind of feeling based on emotional or some unbiblical idea. The emotion. There's some the churches there that say that you can come to our church. Like Pastor Prince, you're going to have victory, a victorious lifestyle. Well, you may have it at your church, at his church, but it's self-deception because the Bible doesn't declare that. That's why we have First John one, chapter one, and verse nine. You get back in fellowship with God, you confess your wrongdoing, your sins. Inevitably, you'll have those. Fellowship with God only comes to a child of God, born of God, by a confession to God, who He, who is light and absolute righteousness. And out of the grace of God, because of the shed blood of Christ, his Son, which cleanses us from all sin. Fellowship does not result from how good the child of God, born of God, behaves or feels, but how much more he is focused upon God's absolute righteousness. Reflect upon how far short you fall, he falls, and then you confess, as compared with the evil nature of his own thoughts, words, and deeds, which he acknowledges to God. And notice that it is Christ himself, oops, by virtue of his giving of himself on the cross for us, oops, let me fix that. A little trouble with this new computer, it's one of those ones that won't break like I've broken my last two by running in the buses. This has a detachable magnetic uh, keyboard and so the hinges won't break and then crash the computer. Anyway, and notice, get this out of the way here. Uh, and notice that it is Christ himself by virtue of his giving of himself on the cross for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special, let me bring it back, his own special people, zealous for good works. But these guarantees will be fulfilled when we go to be with him and are transferred into perfect individuals in the resurrection bodies like the Lord's. So this wonderful end is indeed part of what he has done for us who believe in his propitiation for our sins and for all humanity, should they believe in him. Notice, it is all by his effort, God's effort, and nothing that we do, we contribute nothing toward that end. Albeit our efforts to attempt to obey the commands in this temporal life are of value, albeit always imperfect. Here in this passage and elsewhere in scripture, to be faithful, do contribute these things, these efforts, do contribute to the reception of eternal rewards above and beyond what Christ and Him alone, I get my fingers on this thing, and Him alone has done for us. So observing what an individual does is not an accurate measure of whether or not he is a believer destined for heaven. And that seems to me what Joseph Prince seems to say. Well, let's look at their lives. And here we go. So how do we know if someone is truly living under the grace of God? If a believer is truly living, we look at their lives. Well, I have very little to say uh, that's praiseworthy of that. That's arrogant. I'll get used to this laptop sooner or later. Are you that righteous that you can tell if someone's conduct demonstrates that they are saved unto eternal life? Have you watched them 24-7? 
discern their innermost thoughts? Is salvation unto eternal life dependent upon their conduct, their works? Well, let's see. And this would mean not just the moment that you get saved, but thereafter in the Christian life. You're not guaranteed a victorious life. Now let's get back to where it was. Here's my favorite passage on this. Compare Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been, literally are having been, saved through faith at a moment's time. And that's all you did. You didn't have any promise later on to lead a faithful, victorious Christian life. And you're saved by grace. Um, Joseph Prince seems to think that you're not under God's grace if you're not uh, acting victoriously. Well, the problem is that you're saved by grace. It has nothing to do with your behavior. It's just, in whom did you believe? And this salvation is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works that no one may boast. That's what the verses say. Now, you want to talk about the Christian life. It's another story. You want to lead a Christian life. But you're not going to uh, violate the grace of God of your salvation. And the grace of God in your temporal life, we just went over, operates in the Christian's life by providing stuff that he didn't deserve, like uh, forgiveness of confessed sins and purification from all unrighteousness. That's by the grace of God to what Christ did on the cross for him for eternal life as well as in the temporal life. So notice that one's salvation unto eternal life cannot be corroborated by one's works because one did nothing to get it, nor did one do anything to keep it. It is the gift of God with no proviso in this passage, in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 8, 9, and all the other passages in the Bible, that they do anything in order to keep it. <clears throat> other passages may not be consulted in order to modify or add to what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 above is conveying. That is the rule of context. Now, you cannot edit a passage based on what another passage says. It must stand on its own context. That is how one learned to read from the beginning of one's schooling in how to read in any book, not just the Bible. Otherwise, the, the Bible or any book is a contradictory book and must be discarded. If other passages say differently, then burn the Bible and find another book to trust in, if you can, and you cannot if you read it properly. Okay. Well, <clears throat> if someone is leaving his wife, Joseph Prince goes on to say, he leaves his wife for a secretary and tells you he is under grace. Tell this person that he is not under grace, but under deception. Well, under the grace way of life, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? So if the guy leaves his wife or his secretary, God's grace is going to provide for his forgiveness of that relative to eternal life. On the other side of the coin, he's going to provide discipline for him as well if he's a Christian. Um, so let me just change, I'd like to change the uh, color of these words because these my commentaries are in blue so let's get the text color put in I just finished this come out yep so actually if someone is saved unto eternal life he has been saved through a moment of faith alone in Christ alone and that salvation is not of himself as it is a gift of God not by works so anything he does after salvation is not required to keep that salvation and when anything he does necessarily reflect that salvation I just quoted Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? He is under grace. Salvation grace. I don't know what, what Joseph Prince is saying. He has been saved by grace and relative to that salvation and to eternal life. He is forever under God's grace no matter what. He is under not under deception at all. He, he may, albeit he may no longer realize that he is saved by grace for one reason or another. <coughs> I don't understand what he's, uh, Joseph Prince is really saying here. I'm just deception. Christian sin, whatever, how egregious the sin is, 
They're not under the 